Escape Chronicle, I'm Jacob McClellan. Adam Cribbley is the director of the Center for Regional History at Southeast Missouri State University and the author of the book Parading Patriotism, Independence Day Celebrations in the Urban Midwest. In this book, Cribbley explores how people in five Midwestern cities celebrated the 4th of July and, expre and expressed their patriotism between 1826 and 1876. The book is published by the Northern Illinois University Press. Adam Cribbley, thank you so much for coming by to talk with us. Thanks for having me, Jacob. So first, w which five uh, Midwestern cities are, are we talking about here? Well, I have three from Ohio. I have Columbus, Cleveland, and Cincinnati, and uh, one from Illinois, Chicago, and one from Indiana, Indianapolis. And so, so how was the typical Fourth of July celebration in the in the 1820s or, or 1830s? In the in the 1820s and 30s, they celebrated in a way that they had for much of the first 50 years of the nation's history. They would start off by shooting guns or cannon if they had them at dawn, uh, and then the morning would be celebrated uh, as a civic celebration. They would have typically parades. Uh, it would end with an oration, usually on the steps of a courthouse or perhaps at a church or other public site where the, the featured speaker, usually a lawyer or, or a preacher perhaps, might talk for an hour or two with, with very common themes, things about patriotism and sacrifice, looking back to the founding fathers. Typically then people would kind of go their separate ways for a while and then in the e evening, uh, usually the, the men would get together and the men would drink toasts. Uh, while the women went off and prepared dinner and, and took care of the kids. But it, it went from a family celebration in the morning to very much a kind of male-dominated celebration in the afternoon and evening. And were these pretty rowdy affairs when the, when the men would go, uh, would, would go to, the, to the saloon or whatever to go have some drinks? Absolutely. And the, uh, they, they regularly published proceedings of these, these toasts the next day in the newspaper. And so the, the way it was set up is that the the men would go in and, and in advance plan a number of toasts and they would they would drink to George Washington or to the Founding Fathers, the, the Constitution, and then they would offer what were called voluntary toasts. It's done after having 10 or 13 drinks already and then those tended to be pretty pretty humorous from from all indications is that as the evening wore on their, their drinking got more uh, more problematic and they got louder and more boisterous so yeah it was it was definitely got got a little rowdy in the evenings usually so, so how did this this uh, these celebrations how did they change in the in, in the decades following that well what you see is that the, those decades kind of are uh, those uh, celebrations kind of followed the same pattern until about the Civil War and during the Civil War right before there was kind of a a, a lull period where communities didn't celebrate quite as much uh, part of that is because in the five cities that I study, we have you know, massive numbers of German immigrants coming into town or Irish immigrants coming into town. And so they kind of divided celebrations where the Germans would have their own Fourth of July celebration and then the non-Germans would have uh, a counter celebration. Um, what we saw though is that the, what I found is that the Civil War though really kind of transformed it. People during the Civil War found that they didn't really like to celebrate with you know, guns and artillery fire and orations. And instead, they wanted to escape. And so we start to see by the end of the 1860s and 70s a movement towards people celebrating the 4th in you know, much the same way maybe that people even celebrate today with picnics. They would go to baseball games. Horse racing was a big, a big event at the time. And so we uh, picnics kind of overcame orations in this more civic parade type of atmosphere that we see before the Civil War. What about like uh, Southern sympathizers, for instance, you know, in a city like Indianapolis during the Civil War? What, did, what would they do for the 4th of July? Oftentimes they wouldn't celebrate it at all. They would intentionally not celebrate or they would make a big deal of celebrating the July the 3rd or July the 5th or, or even in some cases celebrate um, when the, the South had seceded from the Union or, or they, would, they would kind of uh, thumb their nose at, at maybe the more Union pro-North uh, pro celebrations that we see in some of those towns. What post-war? What about uh, African American celebrations? What do we see? What do we see from African Americans in uh, uh, in these Midwestern cities? Well, as you can imagine, before the war, they don't really celebrate much at all. Uh, those that do celebrate typically do so well out of town, kind of quietly, without much notoriety. After the war, especially in you know the the, the immediate post-war years, African Americans in these communities are very excited about celebrating, and so they hold huge Fourth of July celebrations. A lot of times, many of them still kind of avoid downtown simply because of you know, the potential for violence and, and, and retribution, but, but they still do celebrate, and especially, like you said, in the late 1860s and 70s, we start to really see African-American celebrations in these communities. What do, what do these Fourth of July celebrations during this time, what do they tell us about, um, about patriotism um, during, this, during this period? Well, they tell us a lot of things. They, they show um, elements of inclusion and exclusion. It was very interesting to me when I was researching how, as I mentioned, 
German immigrants, when they came in in the 1850s, were very, very enthusiastic about celebrating the holiday because, after all, this is their adopted nation, and they wanted to demonstrate how patriotic they were. Yet, at the same time, many of them were excluded from maybe we call it the mainstream celebration. And so the Germans would hold their own parade and were not invited into the other parade. They would hold their own um, celebration outside of town and not be invited to the civic celebration in town. And so uh, we really see this sense that um, elements of inclusion and exclusion that on the 4th of July mirrored what was going on in American society at the time. Now you, you mentioned around the time of the Civil War is when we start seeing celebrations that are, um, that are more like today's. Mm -hmm. Um, when did we see that, that, that complete evolution to what we see, to what we see now, what we typically see as a, as, a, as a Fourth of July celebration? Well, I think really by the, by the late 1800s, we start to see a very modern Fourth of July emerge. We have fireworks are becoming more prevalent in the 1870s and 1880s. Uh, there's a, a big movement beginning in about the 1910s called the Safe and Sane Movement because apparently doctors are concerned that too many kids are blowing off fingers. And so there's a movement to try to eliminate fireworks from the Fourth of July and to make it make it safe and sane, you know, eliminating alcohol and fireworks from the 4th, and, and that really doesn't stick. So <laughs> really, uh, kind of the 1880s, 1890s, we start to see what we might consider a very modern 4th of July celebration develop. How did you, um, how did you, you get interested in this? What was it that attracted you to this, uh, to this, to this topic? Well, it actually began as a, as a project completely different. It looked at a, at a riot that took place in Chicago um, in 1855, and as I read more about that topic, the more I got interested in some of the fallout from that. And the event took place in, I believe, April of 1855. Um, but in the, at the 4th of July, there was a big kind of uh, hubbub about, you know, is this going to take place again? And so as, I, uh, as you, know, you do research, you kind of follow a, a path that might not be the one that you intended it initially. And so what began as a project looking at the lager beer riots in Chicago in April of 1855 ended up in a, in a, in a book about the 4th of July. So it, it kind of <laughs> went off topic, um, but I still managed to include some of the research I did about those, those riots and how they kind of tied into the 4th. Any, any particular reason that you looked at the five cities that you, uh, that, you, that you looked at? In part, it was accessibility. At the time, uh, when I started the project, I was a graduate student at Purdue University, and so Chicago was accessible. I had family in Ohio. And Indianapolis was, uh, you know, just a few hours away, so it made sense. Um, I considered St. Louis and strongly considered it, but in the end, the fact that St. Louis was a city in a slave state made it. Uh, it just would have brought in another mm -hmm. element that I think I, I wasn't ready to deal with at the time. We've been talking with Adam Kribble. He's the director of the Center for Regional History at Southeast Missouri State University and the author of Parading Patriotism: Independence Day Celebrations in the Urban Midwest. Adam Kribble, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Jacob.